Hello and welcome to today's lesson. We've got a review of sampling distributions. So when we look at a sampling distribution, okay, a sampling distribution is created by graphing all of the possible sample averages or proportions. Okay, so it's always dependent on what type of data that we have. Okay, so all of the averages, all of the proportions of the same size. Okay, so we need to know our sample size for the entire population on the same axis. Okay, so if we look at our population, this population is skewed right. Okay, if we want to do a sampling distribution from this, what we're going to have to do is we can sample different sizes. Okay, notice if we do a sample of size 2 and we build the distribution, all sample size 2 from this population is still a skewed right graph. Okay, that sample size is a little small, doesn't match the population value overall. But if we do a sample of size 25, Okay, and remember what we're doing. We're taking a sample of 25 values, creating one average, and putting it into the distribution. And then we keep doing that for all possible samples in this population. Okay, and we have a large enough sample size. We can see that we get something that looks normally distributed. Okay, the shape of it is normal or symmetric. Okay, and then we want to find our mean and standard deviation. Okay, now, when we're doing sampling distributions, we have to verify three things. The number one thing, and it goes all the way back to our first unit, we need random sampling. Okay, if we don't have random sampling, we can't trust our data. So that's the first thing that we look for, and we just copy that information into our answer. A random sample of 25 adults from the United States population. You know, we can put that into our answer. So we've verified that it's random. We can trust our values. The next thing that we look at is independence. Okay, this is our Goldilocks idea. The sample can't be too big, can't be too small. Okay, so we have to make sure that our sample size is small enough that each sample is independent of any other sample. So if you think about Minnetonka High School, over 3,000 students. If my sample size is 2,000, one sample of 2,000 has too much overlap of another sample of 2,000, and they wouldn't be independent of each other. Okay? Too much overlap creates an issue when it comes to independence. So what our goal is, okay, we also call this the 10% rule. We want to ensure that our sample is less than 10% of the population. Because if you think about it, breaking the population up into small chunks, there's less chance of overlapping data from one sample to the next. Now, the formula that we use to verify the 10% rule for independence is this 10N is less than capital N. Okay, our sample size times 10 is less than the population size. Okay, so now let's say I sample 2,000 adults from the United States. Okay, how we verify 10 times 2,000 equals 20,000. 20,000 is less than all U.S. adults. Okay, we're not necessarily going to know the number every time, but what we know is we can get a grasp of what the size of the population is. You know, if we're dealing with MHS, okay, and my sample size is 250, okay, we would do 10 times 250 equals 2,500, which is less than the population of Minnetonka High School. Okay, so we're looking at that. We have to verify that. We have to show these pieces as a part of our work. Okay, that we have verified that our sample size is small enough to be independent of all the other samples. Now, the next thing that we have to verify is that we have a normally distributed sampling distribution. 
Okay, because if our sampling distribution is normally distributed, then we can use z values going back to our normal distribution work that we did in our last unit. So if our sampling distribution is normal, then we can use z values. And based on the type, we have different ways of verifying whether or not it's normal. So if we're dealing with sample proportions or percentage values, we have to do these two calculations, n times p, n times 1 minus p, and make sure that both of those values are greater than 10. If that's true, then we know we have a normally distributed population, and then we can move forward and find z values and find probabilities. If we're dealing with a sample means problem, we have our best case scenario. If you're told that the population is normal, then we know that our sampling distribution is going to be normal. And we just copy that sentence from the problem. Otherwise, we have our next piece, and it's working with your sample size. Your sample size has to be large enough to assume normality. And this is the idea of the central limit theorem. So sample size greater than 30, it can go down to sample size greater than 25. Okay, different textbooks use different values here. But if your sample size is large enough, greater than 25, greater than 30, then you can assume that you have a normal sampling distribution. And once you've done that, then we can start working with z-values. Okay, remember what a z-value is. Given minus average divided by standard deviation. And what we have to do is we just have to make a small adjustment for standard deviation based on sample size. So everything else is the same. Here's your given average from your sample data. Here's the population average given to you in the problem. And then we have to find our adjusted standard deviation. Okay, the adjusted standard deviation, we have to divide by the square root of sample size, shrinks the standard deviation down, because if you're sampling individuals and finding an average, okay, we won't get as extreme spread with those values that we would with the entire distribution. Okay, we can see that when we look back at these graphs. Okay, you can see that these two graphs down at the bottom have less spread than the original population because they're based on sample average values. And that's why we have to make the adjustment in the denominator. Okay, once again, dealing with proportions, p hat is our sample, p is the population value, and then our standard deviation is based off of the population using that value in our sample size to find our z and then once we find z values, everything else we do is based on the normal distribution and probability statements. So you can have a z greater than some number equals your answer. Probability that z is less than some number is equal to your answer. Probability that z is between two numbers is equal to your answer, and that goes right back to our normal distribution information. Okay, so really only a few big ideas, few changes here. The big change is standard deviation adjusted based on sample size, and the idea that we have to verify that it's normal, verify that it's independent, and look for random samples stated in the problem. Thank you and have a good day.